this talk will be focusing very specifically on unaccompanied minors. With that, we need to define who we're talking about. And you'll notice here, this term is not a term I'll be using during our talk. This is how the federal government defines this population, unaccompanied alien child, which I find to be a very dehumanizing and othering term, which is why instead we will use the term unaccompanied minors, which is the most common one used in the literature, but there are sometimes other um, documents that will refer to these children as unaccompanied children, unaccompanied immigrant children, or unaccompanied immigrant minors. Sorry, there's a, a bit of uh, lawn noise on the outside. Now, this population refers to children under the age of 18 who have no lawful immigration status in the United States. And at the time of their apprehension, they are not accompanied by a parent or legal guardian. This is in contrast to accompanied children who arrive with a parent or legal guardian. It is important to note, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a moment, that not all of these children arrive alone. A lot of them do arrive with family, but they are not guardians. So they might arrive with a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, um, someone to whom they're related, but does not have actual legal guardianship over them. Now, before we dive into this, I think a lot of people have heard, um, you know, seen the, the headlines, heard the sound bites, but what gets lost in all of this is we get tied up in the statistics and we lose the individual stories of the children. This picture here is very similar to one that I saw drawn by a child who I will call Diego. I spent six weeks down in Brownsville, Texas, working at ORR shelters and met hundreds of children um, back in October of 2017. And this picture is similar to the one Diego drew when he was asked, why did you come to the United States? You can read his words here. I wanna eat pineapple, play soccer and be with my daddy. He came here for a childhood. And unfortunately, further into the interview with his legal advocate, we learned why he was not able to find a childhood in his home country of El Salvador. There was a shooting where a neighbor was shot in front of his house. His grandmother was afraid to let him go outside, so he had to stay indoors, which meant more time with his physically abusive uncle. His grandmother didn't know what else to do, so she sent him to reunite with his father. Diego's story is unique, but unfortunately, it's similar in a lot of ways to a lot of the children that we see. These pictures here are of the hands of hundreds of unaccompanied minors who did an interview with the UNCHR. It's a really beautiful report. I encourage you to read it, hear about their stories. And before we begin, I just wanna frame this talk with an important quote from Dr. Fernando Stein. Children do not immigrate, they flee. And particularly with the population that we're gonna talk about today, these children are often fleeing from very difficult, dangerous and life-threatening circumstances in their home countries. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of context right now for uh, why we're talking about this um, now, but I just want to set the stage that this is an issue that I think many of us through our careers have been seeing um, have, period have periodic spikes in new um, immigrant arrivals and especially unaccompanied minors at the southern border. This is sort of the latest um, in many spikes um, of arrivals of unaccompanied minors. So you, you can see from this uh, this chart here, this is uh, for fiscal year, by fiscal year, Southwest land border encounters um, by month. Um, and the years are listed at the top. Um, you can see the orange line is 2019, and you can see that there was a spike that was happening. Um, there was always a higher rate of uh, arrivals in the summertime. Um, and you can see that that happened here. And then the numbers uh, started to come down, uh, uh, coming down into the colder season. Last year, that which is in red, you can see those numbers are very low, um, and that is reflective of the fact that um, we had the coronavirus pandemic, and essentially, for reasons we'll discuss a little further, our border was essentially closed. The blue line here is this year, and as you can see, there's a large spike um, in arrivals uh, happening now. Um, and if you look at the uh, graph on the right for a fiscal year comparison by demographic, um, you can see the, the comparison for arrivals of unaccompanied um, children, um, which, is, uh, which is what's represented here in blue being uh, this current fiscal year. Next slide. So 
in March of 2021, so last month, there were nearly 19,000 arrivals um, of unaccompanied minors uh, at our southwest border alone. Um, that rate, if you compare it to prior, uh, even 2019, we're on pace at this point to increase uh, even beyond the numbers that we saw in 2019. Um, over 400,000 uh, unaccompanied minors have crossed the border since 2003, and then in the most recent fiscal year, which is actually pretty similar to prior years, is um, uh, if you compare it, um, about 84% of the unaccompanied minors are 13 uh, years or older, and about 68% are, are male. Um, and if you look at the country of origin, and this as well has been consistent for recent years, the majority of the arrivals are coming from Honduras, uh, Guatemala, and El Salvador, which are known as the Northern Triangle. Next slide. Um, so why do we care here in LA County? Um, and so you can see in this list, these are the top five destination counties in the United States for unaccompanied minors as of March of 2021. Um, Los Angeles County consistently um, is number two on the, on the list, um, just coming after uh, one of the counties in Texas. Um, so this is a really important issue for us. Um, I think we also see this in large part now as um, we're a, a site where they're setting up um, emergency intake shelters, and so um, it's becoming even more relevant for, for those kinds of reasons. Um, but we are a, a large resettlement um, area, and as many of, as all of you, I'm sure, know from your clinical practice, um, this is a very salient and relevant issue for us always, but in particular during times of surge. Next slide. So today what we're going to talk about um, is uh, about the migratory journey. And I just want to say that we, we're not going to have time to talk about the entire journey. We're really going to focus mostly on um, the post-migratory journey. Um, Diego's story is, is not unique. And so today what we're going to look at is um, factors that are things we can use as frameworks as we apply um, uh, you know, the, the resources that exist uh, to the care of unaccompanied minors. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, specifics that you might consider for different children, but again, trying to create a framework that you can use as you um, encounter immigrant um, children. Uh, I'll just say in summary, the, the things that we'll be talking about for the post-migration. So we'll talk a little bit about stresses related to families adaptation. We'll talk about difficulties of education in, the new lang in a new language. We'll talk about acculturation, um, discrimination and social exclusion. But a large part of what we're going to talk about as well is, is the clinical care, you know, screening for different kinds of physical um, uh, and emotional trauma. Um, and so that all ties in with these other um, places that where unaccompanied minors are vulnerable and at risk um, of, of trauma. Next slide. So immigration is a complicated issue. There are many, many push factors as well as um, pull factors that drive migratory trends. Um, for those of us who've been working with unaccompanied minors recently, I think uh, we've seen that fear is very uh, significantly um, the reason overwhelmingly um, that is listed. And so it's often fear based on either gender-based violence um, or gang-based violence. And then uh, I think, unfortunately, there's always been sort of a background of uh, children fleeing abusive situations, either with parents or other, or other caregivers. Next slide. However, I just want to sort of say that, that children's reasons for leaving home are, are often complicated. And I actually think Diego's story was a, was a um, sort of clear example of that. So this is from that same UNHCR report that Lisa referenced. Um, this was a survey. They, they basically interviewed unaccompanied children that were arriving at the border. This was in the early uh, 2010s, I think it was 2013. Um, and what they did was they tried to assess, amongst other things, why children were leaving um, their homes. And as you can see, there is a lot of overlap. Um, there also are variations, even if you look within the Northern Triangle countries, and we're not going to get into that um, today. But um, so if I said, I, I would say to say that, um, again, gender-based violence, abuse in the home, abject poverty, um, and then uh, gang-based violence um, generally are the biggest reasons um, why children are fleeing, and then uh, obviously reunification with the family. Next slide. This, um, slide is mainly to show, I, I, I think it's important to sort of see what the journey looks like. This is not an easy journey. And I, I know I don't need to convince this, this group um, of that, but I, this isn't a journey that children take lightly or that families or parents take lightly. And, and I think as a, I say this uh, in part here, just thinking about it from an advocacy um, standpoint, this is a long journey. It's physically long. It's emotionally long. There are a lot of points of vulnerability along the way. Um, and uh, I, the way I often think about it is, you know, again, as a, as a parent, as a pediatrician, 
who puts their child at risk like that, right? Unless there is a, a very real fear on the other side. Um, and I think that that, um, that point is just really important. Um, and I, I like this picture just to sort of say exactly how arduous that is um, to frame the context of what we're talking about. Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit just briefly um, about the pre-migration and migration experiences, again, just as it informs um, what happens once children arrive at the border. Slide. Uh, so these are some images um, of the journey. Uh, this in particular is a train called La Bestia, which is a, a large train that uh, children often um, will take uh, to uh, traverse sort of large swaths of land on the um, on the journey up to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border. Um, you can see this is a very very risky and precarious situation. Many many children and adults have lost their lives, um, have lost limbs um, along the way. Um, it is uh, a, a place that even when they're on the train is not often safe. They're often um, vulnerable to uh, all kinds of violence, sexual violence, robberies, um, many, many other forms of, of violence. Um, and I, I, I think it's just, again, important to contextualize the journey that children are taking. Next slide. So we're going to transition now to talking about apprehension um, and processing experiences um, at the Southwest border. Um, next slide. So this is a complicated um, graphic and we really uh, tried to organize it in a way, um, and I'm gonna give Lisa a lot of credit for this, in a way that um, uh, makes it easy for everyone to understand the, the flow once children arrive at our border. Um, as Lisa said, uh, the caveat on it is that we are going to um, keep it fairly focused on unaccompanied minors, but I'll give you just a little bit of context for um, family units that are arriving at the border. So all uh, children ar that arrive at the border are initially detained in CDP custody. Um, they're uh, detained in what are called processing centers. We'll talk about that a little more in a subsequent slide. There's basically two major forks um, that happen at that point in terms of determining what happens to uh, a child that is arriving at the border. So the first um, fork is whether or not the child is arriving with someone um, that can be verified to be a legal guardian. As Lisa said, sometimes people are traveling with other individuals, but that those individuals are not legal guardians. Um, and so uh, that can cause uh, issues. Um, we're not going to talk about family separation today, but if we were, this would be where that conversation would happen. So if there's questions about it, we can answer that at the end. Okay. So assuming that they do arrive with a legal guardian, so we're now we're saying this is a family unit arriving at the border. There's three options in terms of what can happen um, at that juncture. The first is that uh, there are expedited removal procedures that are in place in the United States. And what that means is that um, they, the Customs and Border Patrol, so that basically the immigration authorities need to screen to make sure that there isn't grounds for um, someone seeking asylum. So if someone says, you know, I'm afraid to go back to my home country. Um, for children, they have to make sure that there's uh, no evidence of trafficking. Um, and then uh, they will assess uh, you know, sort of their level of, if there's any major concern for them going back to their country of origin. But basically we have expedited removal procedures in place, which means um, that, that uh, uh, adults and family units can be um, removed without any further immigration processing um, under those uh, procedures. Uh, if they say that they do have a, a claim for asylum, um, then, uh, then the options in terms of where they can be housed for immigration, the rest of their immigration proceedings, um, is they can be housed if they're arriving in a family unit in Immigration and Customs Enforcement in family residential centers, um, or they can be released into the community awaiting immigration hearing. I'm not gonna go into the details of the family residential centers except to say that they're really not being used right now, um, and that the family residential centers are limited in, in number. Um, and so what that means is that uh, this is where there's that, again, if we're gonna talk about family separation, where we would be talking about it, um, and also why there can be issues with you know, whether or not uh, families are released into the community, okay? Um, next. So if the child uh, does not have a legal guardian identified with them, the next fork is what country they are from. Um, so there are, are policies in place for children that arrive from non sorry from contiguous versus non contiguous countries, um, and these policies are related to the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. Um, so if children are arriving uh, on their own um, and they're coming from a contiguous country, so Mexico or Canada, 
um, they're, they're still able to be um, processed through expedited removal procedures. Again, they do still need to verify. And it's, I, I actually, for family units, I actually, I think it, it's much more of a, a bigger deal for unaccompanied minors, the trafficking piece. They have to screen them to make sure that they're not victims of trafficking. Again, they have to assess if there's any concern for um, an asylum claim. Um, and then uh, they have to make sure that they can be safely returned to their um, country of origin. Um, but assuming that that is all the case, then they will uh, remove them under expedited removal procedures. I know that sounds like a high bar, but it's really, for the most part, that's what happens to, to children from this um, from these, in these countries. If the children come from a non-contiguous country, um, then there are special procedures that are in place under that Trafficking Victims Protection um, Reauthorization Act. Um, so unaccompanied minors typically are placed in a shelter or other facility that's operated by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, and I'll talk a little more about why that matters in subsequent slides. Next. Um, and then the goal for unaccompanied minors is to release them to the care of community sponsors for the duration of their immigration proceedings. And immigration proceedings can last a very, very long time. It's, it's variable, again, depending on the um, administration that's in, in place, uh, how they're prioritizing which cases, um, how many judges are available. But just know, generally speaking, these processes take a, a very long time. And, and LA County is actually one of the counties that has one of the largest backlogs of immigration um, uh, court cases uh, in the country. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this up just for one second, just for everyone to see it. So basically the first fork is accompanied or not, and then the second fork is uh, contiguous country or not from a contiguous country. And so we're largely gonna be talking about the children once they um, come in that are from a non-contiguous country that are then gonna go through the ORR um, uh, pathway. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, in the beginning, so the CDP processing centers, I think um, many of us have heard about this in the news, they're called La Hilera, um, otherwise known as the freezer. Um, the, these processing centers are, are unfortunately very well known for the conditions that um, exist. Uh, you can see children in basically on hard floors, the lights are often on. Um, they're giving these mylar blankets to stay warm. Um, the um, the um, facilities are, are uh, very well known again for being very cold um, and children find them uh, sort of universally to be very uncomfortable um, experiences uh, in terms of um, their, their stay. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more, but basically children are not supposed to stay in uh, the CDP processing centers uh, for it's supposed to be more than 72 hours. Um, however, depending on the availability of ORR shelters, um, they often will stay for longer periods than that. And so, for example, um, right now, while, while we're in a surge situation, this is almost, again, universally the situation that children are um, staying longer um, in CDP processing centers because they don't, they don't have a, a place for um, them to, to go, which is, again, part of why they're creating these um, emergency intakes. Okay, next slide. Um, so immigrant children uh, are protected under an agreement called the Flores Settlement. Um, the settlement was initially uh, agreed upon in 1997, and then there's been modifications um, since. Um, the, the major modification, I'll say that up front, and then I'll give you the details of the agreement, is that um, the settlement applies both to unaccompanied children, but it also actually applies to children in family units, um, assuming, again, that they're not removed under um, expedited removal. So the major principles of the Florida settlement is that children must be released from custody without delay and preferably to a parent in less than 20 days if they're in an unlicensed facility. Um, and then they also um, must be held in, a, in the least restrictive and in an appropriate setting. Um, what that means is that the facilities are supposed to be non-secure, which I know sounds like a bad thing, but it's a good thing. It means that they're not in a jail. It's not locked down. Um, and then the facilities have to be licensed by child welfare agencies, which is one of the highest standards that exist in terms of you know, safety standards um, for children. Um, the minimum standards include sustainable living conditions, um, access to food, um, uh, uh, adequate food, um, privacy, humane discipline, appropriate medical, dental, and mental health care, adequate educational services, um, and then uh, family reunification and legal services, which that part is um, limited. It's not, I, I just wanna be clear that it's not like, oh, here's a pro bono attorney. That's not what that means. Um, but it does mean that they're guaranteed like a know your rights presentation. I think it's within 10 days of arrival. Um, and then uh, usually a consultation with a lawyer, even if they don't actually follow with that, that lawyer. Um, th that part's not always true, but it's what's supposed to be happening. Um, 
the the ORR shelters um, operate under under those standards, and so you know it's a it's a very tricky situation. And I'm going to sort of say this very clearly: the official, you know, I want to be clear that what's best, what the best interest of the child is to never be in detention. Right? Children should never be detained, um, and I just want to say that unequivocally. Um, and the reason I'm going to say that is because what we're going to talk about for the next few slides is about when you detain children, how to how to do it. Um, so I just want to say very clearly. To me, the and and again, the AAP um, has said this unequivocally as well. Children should not be detained, and the ideal place for children is with um, family legal guardian or an adult adult sponsor that's been identified for them again safely. Um, that said, we're going to talk about ORR shelters um, now. So our ORR shelters are um, what I would say in terms of detention, probably the highest. I mean, definitely the highest standard of what's available in terms of. Um, uh, standards of medical care, uh, support, emotional, social support, um, and access to legal services um, for children that are being detained in immigration custody. ORR shelters, so ORR um, is through um, Health and Human Services from the federal government. Um, they contract with a network of child welfare agencies, both NGO and governmental, to care for unaccompanied um, children. Uh, they have a range of facility types. Um, you guys may have heard if there were hearings last year, I believe. Um, where they were trying to set up another ORR shelter uh, in LA County. Um, they have varying levels of security, but again, they're non secure um, facilities. Children are provided with dormitory style rooms, they have shared bathrooms, there's showers, um, they are given clothes, hot meals, there's year round educational services and recreational activities, and then again, limited legal um, services. Um, the, again, the majority of children that you will see will have spent some time here. They're, usually, it's about 30 days, is how long um, they're spending in these. Um, in these uh, shelters, um, but uh, it's, I think it's important to sort of understand that almost everyone will have come, come through these if they're arriving as an unaccompanied minor. The difference is in situations of surge. So all our beds are limited. Um, and and we reached the capacity uh, for OR beds uh, sometime in, I believe it was in early 2021, the first, um, uh, we'll talk briefly about the site, but the first influx um, site was opened in February of 2021. Um, and so we reached capacity in terms of beds. And when that happens, then we have to start thinking about um, what are the options in terms of housing uh, children so that they're not stuck in CBP custody. Um, but it's this line, right? And I think as pediatricians, it's a very important advocacy line between um, are we provide? Are we? We know that we know that whatever we're providing in terms of emergency intake sites or influx sites, that those are likely safer than if the child one was still uh, in Mexico or still in their country of origin. Um, but we want to make sure we're advocating for as high a standard as possible. And so, if they can't meet OR standards, um, then we need to be advocating uh, to kind of push that needle as much forward. And then again continually advocating that children should not be detained. And so trying to figure out as fast a way for children to get released into the community. Next slide. So after children are released um, from ORR shelters, about 76% of children are reunified with close family. Um, this number varies depending on who you ask. There's people that say it's like 60 to 80% 60 to 80 of the number I usually hear. I, I've seen a few reports where it's at 90%. It does depend a little bit. About 53% of these children are reunified with parents and 47% with um, other family members, and that's of the 76%. 9% um, are released to distant relatives or to unrelated adult individuals. And then this is actually a big issue. 15% um, of children ultimately age out into adult care, which is a, a flaw, I would say, in the system um, currently is that uh, children can age out. There's again, it's an area of advocacy that um, is happening. And then uh, some percentage of children will return voluntarily to their home country. And there's, off, there's a multitude of reasons that we're not going to get into today about why that would happen, um, but it does happen. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's a, some uh, percentage from the get re receive another designation. Again, we're not going to talk about that um, right now. Um, okay. So we're just going to leave a little bit of time right now to talk about the current situation. And I, I don't want to overcomplicate this because we could talk about this probably for 20, 30 minutes easily. Um, but I just want to sort of hit the highlights of what, what um, sort of led us into this situation um, and has kind of created um, the, the reason why we have so many um, children arriving right now. So effectively, there was a background of policies that were already in place prior to the 
coronavirus pandemic hitting. Um, and that background of policies um, included things called like the migrant protection protocols and metering. There were some um, policies that went into place making it uh, making the process for matching children with sponsors once in the United States, uh, like adult sponsors or family members, um, more difficult. Um, and, and I won't go into the details of those except to say that that already was kind of creating a backlog um, at the southern border um, of children and family units, as well as individual adults um, waiting to come into the United States. When the coronavirus pandemic hit, um, the, the um, US government at that time essentially closed the border and they used a pol it's a pr process called type Title 42, which is a public health measure. And so they effectively said, you know, due to this public health crisis, our border is closed. Um, and they were not, they just would expel anybody that was uh, present, like that was crossing um, without authorization. Um, and then effectively, again, the, the borders of ports of entry were completely closed. And so no one was coming in. Um, there were very, very few exceptions to that. Um, uh, and again, we won't get into the details of it, but just suffice it to say that essentially the border was closed. And as you can imagine, that created um, a backlog at the, at the border. When the Biden administration came in, um, they actually did not rescind Title 42 um, application, uh, which again is an advocacy, as a big sort of advocacy point, and we can have a, a larger discussion about that. But they, but they didn't. Um, the one caveat is that they did begin to allow um, uh, unaccompanied children to come into um, the United States, and, and actually, I should say, just in terms of full context, uh, that wasn't uh, necessarily the Biden administration doing it. It was the ACLU sued the Trump administration, um, and but the actual allowing didn't happen until, um, I think, with the pace until the beginning of this uh, calendar year. Um, okay, so the, the situation with the ORR beds limited has meant that they've needed to create alternative um, locations for uh, children to um, be cared for, right? And, and I, I do think ultimately the intention is good, right? They're trying to create facilities where we can provide as high a standard as possible in terms of, um, of care. But again, these facilities, because they're sort of being built on, but they, they don't have OR, they're not licensed child care facilities. And so there's ongoing discussion about how um, different states are going to respond to that. Um, but, uh, but I think that's kind of the, the caveat of it. And so the two um, sites that I think are most relevant, so in, influx care facilities and then emergency intake sites. Um, so influx care facilities are care facilities that actually, they do have a higher standard in terms of um, what is supposed to be provided uh, for unaccompanied minors. Again, it's not quite at OR standards, but it does have more of the medical, legal, social services. And then, um, and then there's the emergency intake sites, which are the ones that are in the news. Um, there's uh, more and more opening every day. At my last count, we were at 10, but I think it's actually more than that now. Um, and there's two in LA County that are opening. Um, so uh, Long Beach Convention Center, um, and then the Pomona Fairplex, Fairplex um, which Shannon uh, mentioned at the beginning of, um, of this talk. Uh, the emergency intake sites universally uh, accept children. They have to be over 13 or over um, in order to um, arrive at these sites. They have to be, they have to speak either Spanish or English. And then they have a series of, you know, kind of looking for specific medical vulnerabilities um, or uh particular situations, so like depending on what kind of situation they're fleeing, if there's a specific worry about them being exposed to harm if they were to go to these sites. Um, but generally speaking, who we're seeing in these uh, facilities are um, teenagers um, that speak either Spanish or English. So again, kind of the population that we've been talking through about through this presentation. Um, these uh, sites are being kind of, they're being developed on the fly. And I think that that's kind of, again, where there's a really important advocacy opportunity um, for us. So, you know, part of our discussion today that when we go and, and tour the facility is going to be kind of thinking through how do we best protect these children? How do we make sure that um, we're keeping them safe? What are the medical considerations that need to go into um, into both how the, the site is set up, but also providing actual medical care? And then all of this on the background of um, us being in a pandemic situation still. And, and luckily the numbers in uh, knocking on my desk um, on, in LA County are not terrible right now, but but still, right, that can change at any time. And, and congregate living settings are clearly not um, an ideal situation to be setting up during um, a pandemic. The other part I would say from an advocacy and clinical standpoint that I'm interested in is sort of going to help us segue. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the legal situation and then segue to the clinical piece is about uh, these are children that are going to be in our communities most likely for a while. 
Um, and so how are we going to handle that? Um, how are we going to best advocate for their medical needs um, as well as their social needs? Um, all right, I'm going to leave it at that. And, and again, we can talk about this, but just suffice to say there, there are thousands and thousands of children that are going to be affected by this. Next slide. All right, so we're not going to go through this, I promise. Um, all of this is to say that uh, the second learning point is that legal support is crucial. Um, the legal system is very complicated. Lisa and I were texting last night, and there are still things I was trying to look up and clarify at the 11th hour to make sure that I fully understood, and I'm sure I don't fully understand. I'm very thankful we, we have lawyers and legal partners, and I would just say um, a reminder that dialogue with legal partners is very um, important. Um, our MLCP, I will say here, just a caveat that they cannot directly um, represent anyone that's in uh, defensive, so removal proceedings um, already um, that's seeking asylum. There are exceptions to so people that are victims of violence or trafficking. And again, we're not going to talk about that in detail today. And you can always refer to them um, and they will guide you on, uh, on who um, someone you see could be connected to for legal representation um, if needed. All right, next slide. But the bottom line is that do unaccompanied minors have access to lawyers? And the answer is no. Um, in, in California, there is a fund through California uh, Department of Social Services um, that is supposed to help um, uh, provide access to legal services um, for unaccompanied minors, but it's not a guarantee of a, of a lawyer. And I would say it's unfortunately one of the better situations in the country in terms of access to a lawyer. Um, but the bottom line is that there's nothing in the Constitution that requires taxpayers to provide counsel to minors in immigration court um, because they, they'd be very expensive. Um, DHS, on the other hand, is represented in every case by a lawyer that is trained in immigration law. So children generally need to find a private lawyer or pro bono counsel. Um, and they often can fall victim to individuals who falsely claim to be qualified to offer legal aid for private. And people spent, again, thousands of dollars on this, um, often all of their savings. Um, it's, so again, from a counseling standpoint for kids that you're seeing, this is just an important um, thing to know. Next slide. Um, this is a very grim, I would say, comic, um, but uh, I think it's sort of representative of the situation, right? So um, there's a judge at one point that said, I've taught immigration law literally to three-year-olds and four-year-olds. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience as the, again, as pediatricians. And I would say right now as the mother of a three-year-old, right? So leave it at that. Next slide. Um, and then this is just the last point on the legal system, which is just to say, why is it so important to, um, have a lawyer and, and you can see these are by fiscal years. This is from a really, oh, I didn't put the citation, sorry. This is from a really great uh, data repository called uh, TRAC, which is run through Syracuse. Um, and uh, you can see by fiscal year, um, uh, the difference between relief rates, um, so immigration relief rates for people that are represented versus um, not represented. Um, and I think I sort of this, can't remember if I sort of the planning company, I'll have to look. But the, 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 the suffice to say this is the, um, the, the rates are much, much higher for people that are represented. Next slide. Okay, um, and I'm gonna actually hand it off to Lisa again now to sort of go through more concretely um, services in our area um, and what you can do in the clinic. Great, so at this point in the talk, I wanna kind of shift gears and we're gonna start talking about those tools that I talked about. What are things that you as a pediatrician can keep in your toolbox to have to be able to help these children should you encounter them? Um, and one of the big ones is legal aid. Um, as Cyril said, we're very lucky to live in the state that we do. When I was in Texas, I saw children as young as six years old representing themselves in court. I'm happy to say that in Los Angeles and in California, that is a lot less common, but not impossible. But if you encounter a child that needs to have a lawyer, you can connect them with the LA County Office of Immigrant Affairs. It's very easy to Google to find. Um, there's the hotline on here and we actually have a contact there who's agreed to receive warm handoffs either from physicians or directly from patients. Um, and they are connected to a network of organizations called the LA Justice Fund, which is many different law firms um, that specifically have dedicated funding for unaccompanied minors. That's not to say that there's any guarantee that they'll have access, but there are places available to help that have earmarked funds specifically for this population. If that's too complicated to remember, or you're worried that they'll get lost in the loop, um, you can also involve our social work team who can connect them with our medical legal partnership here at all of you. 
Um, as Cyril mentioned, this uh, neighborhood legal services are legal partners not able to do direct representation for their immigration case. However, they can screen them and help get them connected to one of those agencies I mentioned. They also can help um, with other legal issues that might come up as well. Now, our next learning point is really trauma-informed care. As you've heard from Dr. Shah earlier in this talk, these children, in almost all cases, have been through pretty significant trauma, complex trauma, many layers of trauma, and over a sustained period of time. So really framing your approach to this in the lens of trauma-informed care is crucial. Many of us on this are probably familiar with trauma-informed care, but for a refresher for those who are not, it's really about the four R's. Realizing the impact of trauma and potential paths to recovery, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma, responding um, in all different steps of care from um, intake to the visit itself to referrals, and then resisting re-traumatization. The simplest way I've heard trauma-informed care described, and I think it really helps me to remember this when I'm approaching the visit, is it's really about changing the question from what's wrong with you to what happened to you and recognizing that a lot of the challenges that these children face and some of the symptoms they may actually even present with are a direct result of the trauma they have experienced. Um, another thing to add to your toolbox, if you haven't used it already, the AAP has a really incredible toolkit um, called the Medical Home Approach to Identifying and Responding to Exposure to Trauma. Um, for the next few slides, if you do have your cell phone on you, we have QR codes here. You can just hold it up um, to your camera and you can bookmark these. They're also pretty easily um, searchable on Google. Um, but this AAP Trauma Toolkit um, has a wealth of resources. Um, it is more broad for just any child who's encountered trauma, but it has some really great um, phrases and framework. Um, and for that first and second are realizing and recognizing trauma. I think one of the important takeaways here is to keep in mind that these, child, these children may present with mental health issues, but almost as often they may present with behavioral issues, school challenges, difficulty sleeping, difficulty eating. And it's really important to keep trauma on your differential when you're approaching this medical visit. Another really important tool to have in your toolbox, um, this one is hot off the press, just released in February of 2021. A group down in Texas um, actually um, did some key informant interviews and some focus groups with unaccompanied minors, their caregivers and providers who are caring for them um, and put together a really beautiful, simple toolkit that summarizes their findings. I'm particularly fond of this one for this population because it really is, um, it's informed by the minors themselves um, and by those with lived experience. And this is really their big takeaways. They took trauma-informed care framework and really applied it to this population and tried to summarize what are the important things to remember for caring for unaccompanied minors. Number one is language. You should never assume what someone's preferred language is, and this is important particularly important for these kids who are often coming from countries where, as has been mentioned, they may not speak English or Spanish. They might actually speak an indigenous dialect and Spanish might not be something that they're comfortable speaking, or if they do, it might be fairly limited. So it's really crucial before you even get into the visit to determine what is their preferred language and get an interpreter or translator um, if available. Um, number two, a lot of these families might have limited health literacy and may have had very limited exposure to healthcare systems in their home country. So in some cases, although we are used to asking open-ended questions, you might need to consider using closed-ended questions in simple language um, when first approaching the visit. You can always start open-ended, but then be ready to follow up um, if you feel like they're not really understanding your question. Number three is using normalizing statements. Again, they may not have been to many medical visits before, so really framing that these are questions that we ask all families, um, help allaying their fears or anxieties about why you might be asking something. And number four, being transparent about why you're asking, but also um, creating a framework of trust, allowing people to take breaks if they need to, make sure that they're aware that they do not have to answer a question if they're not ready to answer it, we can come back to it um, and really being thoughtful about your approach um, to gauge the body language um, of the, the child and the family that you're interviewing. 
Um, again, this is really about building trust. Um, so really connecting with the family, um, allowing um, them to sort of guide the pace of the visit. Um, and then understanding that each of their situations are unique. We have talked about some general trends and a framework to approach this, but keep in mind that the child in front of you might have had a very different experience than your perception of what they've been through. Um, in a lot of cases, they might be very nervous or frightened at the visit. Um, anytime that they're interacting with someone outside of their house, some of these children might have fears of deportation, either of themselves or of their family members. Um, they're facing challenges in a number of different areas of their lives and need a lot of different areas of support. Um, these are some of the key themes that they took away from the interviews. Um, number one, keep in mind, as we've talked about, a lot of these kids are teenagers and they're going to go through all of the normal challenges of the teenage years on top of everything else that they're going through. So adolescence is a time of awkwardness with relationships, increasing independence. So all of those factors are at play in the context of these very, very difficult challenges that they're facing as well. Um, number two, a lot of them are facing significant discrimination and social isolation. Um, they often feel labeled or excluded at their schools. Um, you can imagine language barriers might be a significant part of this. Um, number three, um, unaccompanied minors need everything. This was a quote from one of the, the caregivers um, that was interviewed in the focus group is really there are so many different uh, services and referrals that are needed for these children, but they all generally fall under one umbrella, and that is safety, physical safety, emotional safety, um, and they, they really, they, they need almost anything um, that you can offer them. Number four, um, legal support comes before health. And again, this is, this is a quote. Um, I was talking to Cyril last night. I think when I picture the, the, the three pillars that these children need, it's almost like a three-legged stool, medical care, mental health, and legal support. And if you don't have any one of those legs, the stool won't stand up. They really need support from all three of those. Um, and if they have anxiety and they're worried about what's going to happen to them and they haven't been connected with a lawyer, no amount of um, good counseling and mental health support is really going to get to the root of that problem. So really being thoughtful about making sure that we identify early if they have legal support and getting connected if they don't. Um, number five is about the complex um, relationships with caregivers. Um, a lot of these children are being reunified with a parent or loved one that they might have spent many years apart from. There's a lot of very complex dynamics here. There's sometimes feelings of guilt or sense of abandonment. Um, it's a very challenging situation for both the child and the caregiver. Um, and there can often be some relational issues when they're first reunited and um, acclimating to um, their new home. Um, and number six, in the context of that, um, a lot of these families are, um, have financial worries and sacrifices that they've made um, to make this possible and are very concerned about um, how to continue to support this child through what could be a, a lengthy and expensive legal process. Um, and number seven, hopefully we've driven this home by now, that really, although we are talking about some trends and generalizations, every single one of these child, children has unique needs. Um, and really um, considering that child in front of you on an individual basis is, is so important. Um, and then lastly, you know, trauma-informed care at its core is really about creating safe spaces um, and making sure that children know that um, our clinic um, and our healthcare facilities are sensitive spaces. We have protocols in place um, to be sure that um, they are protected should um, immigration enforcement ever come. There are protocols in place um, to ensure that we're not uh, putting them at risk um, and really emphasizing that this is a place where they can come and speak freely um, and we, we are here to serve them um, and do not, uh, do not cooperate or share their information um, with government agencies that might have um, different motives at play. Now, um, with the limited time we have left, I'm going to zoom through this a little bit because a lot of it you can access online. Um, I think a lot of us um, approach these visits and think, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. How do I approach this? And if I leave you with nothing else today, I want you to take home. You're already doing this. This is really a regular well child check. There's just a few extra special considerations for you to think about and referrals to think about at the end. Um, 
If you have not already seen it, please check out the National Toolkit. Um, it has both a PDF and a really great interactive website where all of this information I'm about to go through is hosted. Um, and you'll see here, this is their table of how to approach the um, first visit. And you'll see it looks an awful lot like a regular well child check with a few exceptions. Um, so I added here um, stars next to the ones that might be a little bit unique. So immigration um, information is something you might not be used to asking about in your social history. Um, and then depending on what part of the world they're coming from, kind of unique experiences they may have had. Um, this is a common question that I get for same day clinic and urgent care. I think I may be interacting with a patient who meets the definition. How do I know for sure? How much detail do I need to get about migration history? And the answer here really is that knowing for sure or knowing the full story is really not necessary. And in most cases, it's not going to be appropriate for you to directly ask about their immigration status. And you should never make any assumptions about where they are coming from or that they've even recently arrived. You really don't know. Um, so instead, what I recommend is conducting a social history as you normally would, but pay close attention for clues. Um, and if you get the sense that there might be something more going on, you can just cautiously enter from a perspective of what resources can I offer you? A family may or may not disclose, but recognizing enough to make that referral to a legal partner or a referral to mental health partner is really the important thing here. Um, and no matter what you do, um, we do not recommend that you document immigration status in the medical record. I'll talk a little bit about the language that I use um, when I'm putting in my referrals and things in a moment. Um, so as far as how to ask immigration history, um, actual nuts and bolts, these are um, clips from the um, trauma toolkit from the AAP. Um, so just open-ended language. Who do you live with? If they say they live with their aunt, how long have you lived there? Where did you live before? These are ways that you can sort of get that answer that we were talking about on that last slide, but without um, pressuring the family. And again, you want to go at their speed and they may or may not feel comfortable enough to share with you at the first visit. Um, if a family does disclose um, that they recently migrated, um, this is some language that I use um, to sort of gauge whether they're ready to probe any deeper, um, if we think it might be necessary. Um, so many of my patients had difficult, dangerous journeys. Can I ask what your experience was like? Um, and what I like about this is it has both a normalizing statement. Many of my patients had a difficult journey, but then it also asks permission. So before going any further, you can gauge whether the family is ready to talk about this. The language here is obviously more geared towards like a teenager. You wouldn't use the term dangerous if you're dealing with a child. And in that case, you might not be talking directly to the child. You're might be speaking with the caregiver as well, but these are just some examples of how you might delicately approach this in a very thoughtful way. Um, and again, letting them lead the pace so we're, we're not uh, running the risk of re-traumatizing them by bringing up something they might not be ready to talk about. Um, and this basically summarizes that, this is from that toolkit with unaccompanied minors again, start where they're at and go slow. Um, don't ask too many questions um, if they're not uh, looking comfortable. Um, and then really, again, trauma-informed care, one of the other cornerstones is approaching this from a frame of um, strength-based approach and resilience. And when there are opportunities to really highlight and congratulate um, a, a child on something, a strength that they have, um, this is a great opportunity to do so. Um, the other question um, that comes up is um, kind of medical history and what treatment they received prior to arrival. Um, just a brief note on what kind of medical care they get when they're in OR custody before they arrive to you. Um, they do have kind of an initial medical exam, psychological exam. They do have access to um, emergency subspecialty and inpatient care if needed. Um, this is basically what they do. Um, I can't get into too much of the details in the interest of time, but they are doing um, initial COVID testing, TB testing, um, and then PET B um, and lead are really the main ones. Um, you can request these records. Um, it's pretty simple if you just Google unaccompanied minor records, or um, this is the link here um, to be able to request from the facilities. Um, in a lot of cases, though, you won't have this available, and you'll sort of be flying blind. And this is the recommendations of what to do in that situation. 
Um, so TB testing, um, slightly different recommendations depending on whether you use CDC versus Red Book, but um, a Quant Gold or if they're on the younger side, a TB, uh, PPD. Um, a CBC with diff to check for anemia and eosinophilia. Um, lead, depending on age, there's different recommendations of one versus two test, uh, test dates. Hepatitis B, um, testing for stool, ova, and parasites and strongyloides. Um, if they're sexually active, HIV, syphilis, um, and pregnancy tests as well. Again, this is all available in the toolkit, so I'd recommend that you refer to this um, uh, in real time. And then referrals, again, this looks really similar to what you would consider for referrals at the end of an adolescent well child check, um, mental health, legal care, um, and support services are especially important in these cases. Um, a quick note on public benefits, again, kind of toolkits for you guys, uh, tools for your toolkit. Um, these children are eligible for WIC if they're under five or if they're pregnant. They themselves do not qualify for CalFresh, but if they live in a household where someone else does, the family might still be able to access CalFresh. All of them are entitled to Medi-Cal, so they can be impaneled and be uh, seen at a DHS site, including all of you, and all of them are entitled to enroll in public school. One important thing to consider is if they're there with a caregiver, um, sometimes if a caregiver is undocumented, they may not realize that they themselves qualify for health insurance. Obviously having um, a healthy caregiver is important. Um, and one thing you can do at this visit is make sure that they're aware about My Health LA and have that caregiver get their own health insurance or health coverage as well. Um, as far as mental health, the good news is um, once they're enrolled in Medi-Cal, they really are going to qualify for mental health services the way any other child would. Um, there's different ways you can connect them. Um, it's basically the same way you would um, any other child. They can either self-refer, you can use um, either a flyer or a resource platform like One Degree. You can have them call the access line. One caveat for the access line is that they sometimes will ask for a social security number when you call. It's actually not required and they can process the referral without it. So one thing I learned from Dr. Amy Shikarchi is that um, one good approach for this is you can do a three-way call and assist the family in calling access. And then when the screener asks for social security, you can say, we don't have that, but here's their Medi-Cal number and they'll just move right past it. If the family were to call themselves and be asked their social, it could be a potentially anxiety provoking event. Um, and then educational rights in addition to school, they um, get all the secondary benefits of school, such as transportation, school-based nursing, free or reduced meals, and special education. Um, last thing I'll leave you with, this is a, a very local tool that Searle and I helped create with our local AAP2 chapter. Um, so you can actually look up resource listings for all of these different categories in our area um, by your zip code. Um, all of this has also been translated onto One Degree, which is the platform that we use here. So if you're wanting to connect a child yourself to services, you can use this. Um, there's also opportunities if you're interested in getting involved in um, forensic exams. So supporting these kids in their legal cases, you can volunteer, um, get training and do um, forensic medical and psychological evaluations. And then um, if you're inspired or interested in any of these topics, we really encourage you to get involved in our local AAP chapter. We have an immigrant health committee that Cyril runs. You can contact her to be added to the listserv. Um, there also is a new national council on immigrant child and family health that has a very robust and active listserv. Um, these are all great ways to um, get involved. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, Cyril, thank you so much for your uh, incredible mentorship over these last few years um, and to those on, the, um, on this slide that contributed to some of the content of our slides. Um, if you missed any of the QR codes, here's another chance to grab them. Um, and I didn't leave much time, but is there any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Lisa and Cyril. Um, we have just a minute for a question, for maybe one question. Um, does anybody, would anybody like to ask a question? I see someone has unmuted themselves. If they would like to speak, they are welcome to.
think the person who unmuted themselves changed their mind. Um, well, thank you so much. I, I think this has left us a lot to think about and a lot of fantastic tools to work with as well. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time and coming and speaking to us today. For everybody else, I will reshare the QR code um, if you didn't get the scan it. Um, and otherwise, we'll see everybody here next week for NICU case conference. Take care, everyone. Should I stop share behind? No. Okay. I Thanks, you guys. That was awesome. Have fun today. Thank you. Thanks.